The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Fast of I, good afternoon. Welcome to Man in Line on Manx Radio. We're open line through till one. So your chance to have your say. Whatever it is you want to have a event about today, text, email, call on WhatsApp, text 166177, email studio at manxradio.com, WhatsApp 166177, call 66 13 68. Lots of follow up on what was said yesterday. Much comment, which I'll try and get to today. Uh, first of all, got a note in from Foster, who said, uh, I was on the Isle of Man two weeks ago, uh, arrived uh, on the Mananin, bought a Go Explore card in the sea terminal, allowed travel and museums. I've travelled on all bus routes several times. The bus was comfortable, seats were great, drivers were great, and the Snaefell Mountain Railway electric tram and steam train, five trips on the horse trams, and the conductor even gave me a thumbs up on passing by as I was waiting on the bus for the airport to travel home. The travel, says Foster. Foster's from uh, Tandragee in County Armagh. Uh, travel was great and fun on the Isle of Man. I did the same trip last year and got Spanish weather. <laughs> Dear. I paid the price for the good weather last year with a good soaking walking from the sea terminal to the Empress Hotel. Museum staff were great. Now, the Isle of Man, says Foster, is a jewel in the British Isles. If only the boat fares were a bit cheaper and the service more frequent from Belfast. Great to return to the Isle of Man after all these years. I was a yearly traveller from 1965 to 1977. And by the way, airport return travel was great too as well. We were talking about uh, the buses and the services that's going on uh, during TT. So Foster, thanks for that uh, drop, uh, that note you dropped in. Uh, I went to the Isle of Man Bank on Friday. The lady behind the counter said the cash machine won't be working until next week. Uh, still not working. Nick in Port Erin, the Isle of Man uh, Bank cash machine in Port Erin has been out of. Apparently they're waiting for the parts. Uh, nearly three weeks the cash machine's been out in Port Erin. I stood for 15 minutes in the queue with one member of staff at the counter. The other member approached two Scottish bikers um, uh, who'd been in the queue only to be told that because they didn't have an Isle of Man bank account, they wouldn't give them cash. Is that true? They wouldn't give them cash because they didn't have an Isle of Man bank account. Surely that's not true. Steve said uh, just regarding airport parking, which we've been on for a, a wee while, you can pay for airport parking using cash and card in the airport at the main desk. So you don't actually have to have the app to park at the... So what's the procedure? Do you, you park first, go in and pay, and then go back out with the ticket? Parking at the airport, says Texter 802, shouldn't require a parking app. Now, there's an assumption that everybody has mobile data. Um, and that what happens if you don't have mobile data? Even if there's a phone number to ring, there's an assumption you have a mobile phone. Surely parking should be accessible to everyone, says 802. This is just a follow-up from... It was last Friday, wasn't it, when suddenly the airport changed the parking configuration and said you couldn't park where you used to be able to park and drop people off and then change their mind later on that day. It was a confusing day last Friday. Uh, the ATM at uh, Alaman Bank in Port Aaron has been out of order for nearly two weeks. Yes, waiting for a part. I was told, go to the co-op and get cash back. <laughs> Wrong attitude, says JK. Cost me to get my money. Uh, why are people afraid to talk about death, says Sue? This is part of the problem, and uh, the assisted dying legislation has excited lots and lots of comment. This is the private member's bill that Dr. Allenson has introduced. It's in the clauses stage at the moment, although the mayor f a member for Aaron Michael, Mr. Cannon, uh, may be putting in a, um, a private uh, member's ad uh, amendment so that it would go to um, a referendum. 
Anyway, Sue says, why? what's the problem? Why, why are people afraid to talk about death? We all die one way or another. Calling it suicide doesn't bother me. It needs to be talked about in order to move forward. But religious views don't mean anything to me and many other people, says Sue. And uh, can you advise people that no such bill exists? Naming it assisted suicide is incorrect and it's never been named in keys as such. Also, what about uh, uh, terminal? What, uh, what about? What is it about terminal illness that some people don't understand, says Southern Andy? I think Mr. Murcott was on yesterday um, uh, talking about the fact that it may be called the assisted dying bill, but it does mention in the clauses suicide. So it is an assisted dying bill, but inside the bill itself, it does refer to suicide. And David's with us. Hi, David. Hi, Andy. Uh, just uh, trying to get some more information regarding uh, the apprentices and how the scheme is going to be funded for the future. And I've got to give a little bit of praise. I've tried several government departments. Uh, one came back and gave me a lead to somewhere else, which is dried up. But I must give praise to Daphne Kane, the Minister for Education, because I'm led to believe it's on her patch, on her watch, that the scheme is going to be changed. Now, obviously, she didn't have the, all the details there, but she's promised to send them on, and then I'll get them to you, because I've had more people on to me saying is, if they're changing the terms of the scheme for funding, helping apprentices, young people to have an apprenticeship to uh, further their career and encourage firms, smaller firms too, and, and some, say, bigger firms uh, to take on apprentices. If the scheme is not right and there's animosity within the industry about it, shouldn't we be talking about it? Shouldn't it be out there in the public domain so having a little input? I'm not an employer, but I was a trade unionist years ago and we used to have the trade union would be straight in there straight away to say to him, what are you doing with this scheme? Why do you want to change it? How can you improve it? And the other question I thought to myself while I'm thinking about all this is, how many apprentices do government carry? How interesting. Do you, I mean, are you aware of any, any internal apprenticeships that government does? Well, it must be uh, actually at the DOI because uh, they, they still have... I'm sure, and I'm not in the know anymore, but I'm sure people will tell me uh, there used to be apprenticeship joiners, definitely apprenticeship electricians, because we're going to need them for the future. Andy, I was talking to a guy today, and I'm saying to him, and we were talking about the future of uh, electricians and stuff like that, putting up PV panels, uh, things for the future, talking about the, the uh, not the university, the College of Further Education, where these uh, um, apprentices will go to to learn the trade. You know, they go, uh, I think they do more than a day a week in my time. It used to be a day a week, and then you were thrown on the job and get on with it. But nowadays, you've got to have um, health and safety. You've got to be uh, up to speed with the new technology. What about mechanics? Why should uh, people be... Uh, I think we will never get to a load of electric cars, but at the end of the day, these garages are going to need mechanics that are going to have to be... Uh, fixing electric vehicles. Well, which after, have after very high voltage. After, after you mentioned it yesterday, uh, the news team are on it at the moment. We're trying to get to the bottom of, you know, what the, exactly the situation is, whether or not the funding is being removed, whether or not whether or not they're trying to change the whole situation. But um, as you say, the I mean, the government always bangs on about how there's a skill shortage on the Isle of Man, and surely one of the best ways to plug the skill shortage is to grow your own. Yeah, and the other thing is, when we have small employers too, maybe a couple of adjoiners and a brickie, right? If they're thinking themselves, oh, we might take on an apprenticeship to help us out because we've got a bit of work going on uh, next year, if government fish some of the smaller schemes out and get the locals to start en engaging in them, should I take on an apprentice? Well, wait a minute. Uh, we don't, they're going to do this or they're going to do that. How 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 are they going to help me as an employer uh, to make sure I can fund an apprenticeship and keep that person employed? We don't want to have an apprentice employed for one year. It does this course for one year, and in the second year, he can't do it. You know, 
we need to allocate money to these things. They're the future. They're the future of us in the island. And really, if uh, any of the ministers would l- like to come on and say, why, it must have been through the Council of Ministers, I'm sure of it anyway, to say, why, why are they fiddling with it? What's going on? Well, I do and hope, I, I do hope it's not what you meant. I do hope it's not a question of money. Surely they, they understand that this is an investment. Well, I, I definitely think so. But the minister, for, uh, and he never came back to me. I did leave a message for him uh, in, in Enterprise there. If they've got, they can fund uh, the hospitality industry with, a, um, I don't know what it was now, 150 quid extra or 300 quid if they work their socks off. You know, why can't they do the same and add a little bit of uh, percentage on to the apprentices to make them sure? Now, everybody wants to be a computer whiz, works in a bank or insurance office. There's a lot of people who've got their skills in their hands, and in future years, we're going to need them. And really, is what a government do to support us all? Yeah. Uh, well, they're, they're, I mean, they're one of the most important things uh, in life. Somebody once said that the hallmark of civilization is efficient and good plumbing. And if we don't have plumbers, then suddenly, I mean, society will start to fall down. You have to have people like plumbers. You've got to have that for society to work. Well, I was told to the guy today, and I, I won't mention his name, but he was really interesting to me, telling about the future. And I said to him, well, you're probably still on the 16th edition, which is a, a qualification a recommendation for electricians. And he said to me, we're on 18, Quirky. You need to get up to speed. And that's how the fast industry is going now, because they're fitting panels on roofs. They're making energy efficiency uh, appliances, uh, even on the plumbing side, air source heat pumps, which I'm not really in favour of. I think they just cost too much money and you don't get a return. But you look at the schools, I banged on about the schools all the time. All those schools are lying there all summer shortly, right? Could have PVC panels on, shunting stuff back to the grid like we're doing on Blackberry Lane. Okay. I love it, but we're only getting 9p. <laughs> All right? <laughs> All right, thanks for calling today. Yeah, All fun. right, appreciate it. 19 minutes past 12. This whole question of whether or not uh, apprenticeships are going to lose um, financial support for the future. It's my, my mate Jerry, who's always said, he, he's in the plumbing trade, and he just said, if you're a good plumber, you will never, ever, ever be out of work because somebody somewhere always needs a plumber. And uh, other craftsmen as well, and craftswomen as well. Uh, we shouldn't discriminate because of cost uh, regarding assisted dying. Assisted death should be available to everybody, like myself, says Terry. I suffer with a long-standing chronic mental health issues and social welfare problems, so yes, I should be able to stop my suffering. Who's to say I suffer less than a physical illness? I'm all for this to be open to everybody regardless, says Terry. Well, this assisted dying legislation has just got many, many people um, interested and there are views all over the place, as it is at the moment, clause of stage, so we don't know whether or not it's going to ever make it onto the statute book. We don't know whether it's ever going to get royal assent, whether it will become law. Of course, we are a little less, a little more, sorry, than two years away from a general election. So whether or not any referendum will suddenly fall into the long grass and maybe be amalgamated into the general election we we don't know but we watch and wait have you encountered a good dose of flirting lately says southern andy not that sort of flirting i have been and consequently i'm feeling very ill and discovered after tests that i've caught the latest covid variant apparently it's called flirt it is F-L-I-R-T on phoning to cancel some appointments I discovered I'm not the only one in the Isle of Man who's tested positive flirt variants causing significant increase across and globally as well it's not great missing some music and racing uh, although I can't go out I don't want to spread it to anybody else regards coughing into the phone <laughs> Southern Andy thanks for that uh, yes apparently it was in 20 t- uh, April I think this year the CDC data showed that um, uh, these are flirt variants. KP2 is the most common American variant with a quarter of all cases just ahead of JN1, KP1.1 uh, representing 
7% of US cases. They're known as FLIRT variants, F-L-I-R-T, because they're characterized by uh, various mutations in the virus's spike protein. You thought COVID had gone away? Oh, think again. There's always something. It's a SARS variant, by the way. Thank you, uh, Southern Andy. When you pay at the desk, you just tell them what zone you're in and give your car registration. So you pay at the desk, you can pay for parking inside the airport. Nice and civilised. Thank you, Steve. That's all you have to do. Presumably that's at the customer service desk, is it, Steve? Uh, it's absolutely true, says 207. I was approached by two bikers as I was getting into my car and they couldn't, couldn't believe the service or the lack of it, says Garth. What are you talking about? Is that the airport? There are no tickets for parking at the airport car park, just parking discs. 15 minute free for anywhere in the car park, 30 minutes in green spaces, 60 minutes for blue badge holders, says 820. Thank you, Crystal. I've sent you some information on WhatsApp regarding the World Health Organization Pandemic Treaty Amendments Bill. We, the Manx people, need to know what our political leaders are doing to protect us. There's plenty of help to do do so, and I've, uh, I have the generous offer to come in in person to assist them from a top Swiss lawyer. I've given the heads up to several key people over the past 12 months or more, but no satisfactory response or action. So Ask them, Andy. It's our human right. It's the stake. It's the interest of the people to be informed about this treaty and what's going to happen if we don't opt out. Well, it's not happened yet, Crystal, and presumably they wouldn't do it behind our backs. So there would be something said about it at the time. And I don't think it's even happened in the UK. Myself and several other motorists, says Graham, were asked by police to move our vehicles for Ramsey Sprint, with TT being on, parking spaces a few, so we had to park on double yellow lines. And guess what? The Ramsey traffic warden gave us all parking tickets. What happened to give and take, says Graham? Parking tickets in Ramsey. We're trying to find out what everybody's asking about the apprenticeship and if the funding is being withdrawn we will try and get to the bottom of that uh, back on the 25th of october 2018 richard's been uh, researching julie edge said the waiting list at nobles were unacceptable in particular the 7000 people waiting for an appointment at nobles for a first appointment after being referred by the gp if 7000 the year before manxcare arrived was unacceptable how can laurie hooper say that now 10,800 people waiting for a first appointment is an improvement and a sign that the £18 million given to Synaptic was well spent. It's obvious the waiting lists are nearly half as much again as before Manx Care took over. Forget Manx Care, bring back the DHSC and the way they did it and did so with spending £100 million less than Manx Care have spent. At least waiting, the waiting list was better. Just ask the now 30,000 people waiting for follow-up appointments if things are better with Manx Care. Well, as I don't know that it's entirely possible to uh, dismantle Manx Care. It's not been there that much, has it? not been there that long. So whether or not uh, they could do that, whether or not there's a political will to actually do that. But uh, Mr Hooper was uh, fulsome in his praise about what's uh, about what's happened this is uh, the 18.3 million pound restoration program that's cut hospital waiting lists for orthopedic that's knee and hip for cataracts and general surgery procedures over 3,000 operations have been delivered as part of the second phase of manx cares restoration and recovery program thank you dick for that and uh, bonzo's with us now hi bonzo Hi there, yes. Um, before I talk about what I'm going to talk about, just to chime in a little on this uh, issue of plumbers and, and such like. Yeah. Um, yes, I mean, uh, you know, we have this problem with um, you know, what's called parity of esteem. You know, that uh, you know, the academic path is always best. Um, you know, getting your hands dirty and stuff is... Is, is not a not a good thing. Um, however, some of the finest um, artists have actually been plumbers. Um, Philip Glass, for example, uh, the minimalist composer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, is it though? He financed his sort of first ensemble by plumbing in New York. Get away! And, and, really? No, and 
No, and driving a cab, yeah. I just, I mean, where do, where does this come from, Bonzo? The, the whole parity of esteem. Where do where do people get off on thinking that anybody who is a site of a, a, somebody's like an artisan? Why is that worse than being an academic? Why is it looked down on? Do you think? Oh, the, oh, that's a, the, oh, many academic papers have been written uh, about books have been written about this, but it dates back to the nineteenth uh, century the 18th and 19th century when um, the Industrial Revolution was happening and it was um, the landed classes and then these people who you know, went around building steam engines and things um, then sort of suddenly got money uh, and then sort of started building railways and stuff. And there was this kind of very much a sort of snobby de- demarcation between you know, people who the people who have land and um, people who do trade. And it, it then sort of permeated its way into the into the academic system. Um, however, um, people have long recognised this in in certain parts of, um, sort of British uh, political life, and the whole system um, in Germany, which treats everything as parity of esteem. Yes, you've got your academic route, um, you've got a very technical route, and then you've got a more generalist route, right? And all of them can access into university courses, you know, and all of them, you know, are, are um, thought of as equally achieved, rather than um, one somehow being, the, you know, the uh, sheep goats, you know, elitist stuff. Yeah. So, and and that was imposed. Well, or should I say that was produced by, of course, Britain. When we occupied the the um, you know, that particular zone of Germany during, after the Second World War, we introduced that system. It, it just that it and it was planned, I think, by the Labour government for here, but it it didn't get, or should I say, the UK, but it didn't get through. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I wonder now with the the kind of, and I think it was it happened in the UK, didn't it, with uh, Mr. Blair, who declared everybody should go to university and promptly made all the polytechnics universities, so suddenly everything was a university, and people are coming out with degrees, and you know, I'm not denigrating them, but a lot of these degrees aren't a fat lot of use in the real world. Well, speaking as someone with a philosophy degree, I've actually found it relatively useful, but uh, but that's neither here nor there. Um, no, th- th- no, this. Uh, oh yes, we must have fifty percent of people going going to university. Great slogan, and and you know, it, it helped get votes and such. But yes, there is a case that um, some of the polytechnics, you know, should have been made universities donkey's years ago and weren't. Again, because of sort of the elitism. But um, you know, the idea that you know every further education college in or college fire education in every town could suddenly sort of rock up and call itself a, a university overnight is mm-hmm. just um, you know it's it, it's obviously silly. But this brings me to the broader point about um, uh, the things across that we're trying to ignore um, the UK general election, um, and I think we're. <laughs> You know, I think we're sleepwalking a bit into uh, into some very hazardous times if we don't uh, you know, keep an eye on stuff and indeed um, you know, have some very good relations with the incoming government because Labour Party um, have essentially boxed themselves in on their tax and economics policy so that there's no money. So where can they get money easily? And Starmer is saying that he wants to do things in his first hundred days and they really make a difference. So I think you might be able to guess where I think you know their first uh, first visits will be. Well, I remember when uh, uh, when Mr. Blair got in in 1997 and and they they came in and you had the normal clamour on the back benches that we must do something about the tax havens, and they mm. set they set up a report. Was it the Andrews report? Uh, mm. a, a, a senior civil servant did it. He uh, it took two years to come to the conclusion that the Isle of Man was way ahead of everybody else in terms. Terms of, uh, in terms of, if you like, um, hygiene with money. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, <laughs> those were in the days when, of course, Blair and Brown had uh, wooed the city 
very very greatly in order to actually get the 1997 win. So I think that report was more a question of them covering their uh, covering their reasoning, as it were. Oh, I see. Uh, poli- uh, politically. Uh, here now, of course, you've got somebody who's under pressure to do things, do things quickly, and hasn't got the money to do them. And with our relationship with the UK, they don't even have to pass any any legislation, primary or secondary. They can just do it via further and other means um, to uh, say, right, we want that. So you think we may be in for another Gordon Brown VAT snatch? Um, well, uh, wasn't that an Alistair Darling VAT snatch? That was, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, well, VAT and other things, you know, I, th- I think, um, or I would hope that people are very, very actively putting the Isle of Man's case to uh, various uh, people in the in the Labour organisation, well, particularly they, those, Bonzo, particularly they always, those special yeah, advisors. They always used to. There were, all, there were always people in the Cabinet Office and they always used to attend meetings. They'd go for briefings, they'd go to Westminster, they'd go to all the... Uh, political conferences, they go and see people. What you would assume and hope that that's happening now with the Canada administration. One would hope, and one would, you know, but uh, I wouldn't go around assuming. Um, and also, it's a question of who you talk to. Um, sometimes the op- the emphasis is more on photo opportunities rather than actually talking to the people who will be the people with their hands on the levers, such as special advisors. Hmm. OK. Um, and uh, you wanted to talk about assisted dying as well, didn't you? Um, just, just, just very quickly. Well, that, um, I don't know what Labour's attitude is on assisted dying legislation. Because it, this would appear, and I've heard uh, mentioned that uh, that appearance might actually be the case, that Jersey and the Isle of Man you know, have been employed um, as a... No small experiment to see if such legislation can go through, and then whether it can go through in in um, England and Wales as a test bed. Yeah. Oh wow. Now, how what Labour think to that? We don't know as yet. I wonder. Okay. All right, Bonzo. Appreciate it. Thanks for calling today. Again. Okay, cheers. Bye. Twenty six minutes now before one. It was me, says two o seven, uh, that told you about the two Scottish bikers on the Alaban bank, and it was me who the same two bikers approached as I was getting into my car because they knew I'd witnessed the way they were spoken to and treated by a member of the staff in the bank. It's absolutely true that they were were refused cash or any service from the bank. Were the two. Scottish bikers. I wonder what the end, what was the specific reason? Thank you, 207. Thanks for that information. What was the specific reason? If you go into a bank, why couldn't they get cash? Terry's uh, text outlaws the concerns of many on assisted dying bills, saying, why shouldn't I have assisted dying for my mental health suffering? Now, once the bill is passed, it opens the door to expansion. It'll only take the next administration to vote to expand it, and the likes of Terry will lobby for equal rights to... Uh, take assisted dying. This won't improve poor mental health services on the Isle of Man, says 572. Dr. Allenson has gone to great pains to say that the, any legislation that, that is, is uh, kind of brought in w- won't be, basically, they won't be allowed to bolt on any secondary legislation to it. And we were chatting yesterday with uh, Mr. Murcott about this. He thinks the same thing, but we don't know. And you're quite right. Any future administration will be um, free to do really what it wanted. But I don't know that whether you can absolutely bolt in that sort of legislation that it can't be varied in the future. I received a letter from Manx Care for an appointment in two weeks. I've not been seen since 2021. I couldn't understand it. I was told a follow-up was from March 2021. Thank you. It was Garth, Garth, by the way, who's uh, telling us all about the Alabama Bank in Port Erin not serving those uh, Scottish bikers. And thanks for that information. Um, 
thanks also to when I was young says David H on 229 I was surrounded by people who knew what they were doing uh, who didn't have qualifications now I'm much older I'm surrounded by people with lots of qualifications who don't know what they're doing well but let's just say sometimes don't know what they're doing that's the way of the world at the moment is everybody's got uh, qualifications but this parity of esteem that Monzo refers to is uh, an interesting point isn't it that some jobs are looked down on by some people and and indeed you know I mean being a plumber I think is a very honourable honourable profession I think doing anything um regarding anything with your hands is perfectly wonderful particularly in motor mechanics oh that brings me on to most important one of the most important things I'm going to say today and it is Tony Redmond who is in hospital in Liverpool, had some damage to his leg, uh, but is conscious. And uh, Tony Redmond, uh, the Manx TT rider, came off and is, uh, was flown to Liverpool. And we wish Tony Redmond all the very best. And to everybody at Red's, Red's um, Motor Mechanics, Red's uh, Motor Works in Domain Road in Douglas, we just pass our very best on to Red and uh, a very speedy recovery for Tony Redmond. So yes, this is uh, this 18.3 million pound restoration program cutting hospital waiting lists for orthopedic, knee, hip, cataracts, general surgical procedures. I think everybody will know somebody who's had a new hip, knee or a new hip or cataracts over the past couple of years. Government reckons uh, between assessment and operation the average wait time for ophthalmology has been reduced by 33 weeks by orthopaedics for 16 weeks and by general surgery for 28 weeks. It's something that the health minister, Mr Hooper, Laurie Hooper, uh, says is sustainable and shows the effect of targeted expenditure. Remember, they Max Care put the money into this company called Synaptic. I think the delivery on this has been absolutely phenomenal. The impact it's had on, on individuals have had these surgeries uh, brought forward a lot sooner than they otherwise would have done. Again, absolutely massive impact on those people. Uh, but also the, those three specialties I mentioned, we're now at a level where Manx Care are of the view that these waiting list levels are sustainable going forward. So big reductions in waiting lists, big reductions in waiting times, and the fact that that should now be embedded and that should be the way we see things going forwards in these three areas. What measures are in place to ensure that they don't creep back up? Uh, so partly it's around improved uh, validation and improved governance and oversight now with Manx Care. Partly it's because uh, of some of the way that they work has improved, so they've, they've changed the way they actually undertake some of these surgeries and some of the work. So one of the key things, for example, that, that's happening, and you'll see this in the report, is much quicker turnaround, so actually discharging patients a lot sooner, people being able to be discharged a lot sooner after surgeries. That's been a, a big help. So there's lots of stuff going on inside Manx Care now to make sure that where they're at with these uh, levels are more sustainable and that they've got a, a handle on it and they can monitor that going forwards. And so, you know, Manx Care typically argues that it's underfunded. Does this programme prove that given the fact that they've only been able to reduce the waiting lists because they've had additional funding? No, I, th I think what this shows is when you set out with something that is targeted and you know what you're trying to achieve at the end. So what we're trying to achieve here was a reduction in waiting lists and also a reduction in waiting times. This was planned, uh, a lot of thought and energy went into making sure this was the right thing to do and that it was going to deliver those outcomes and actually we followed through. So I think what this does show is that when you plan your expenditure and you, you have these kind of planned approaches to, a, in this case, a targeting waiting list or whatever it may be, uh, the Manx Care is fully capable of delivering. And do you think then that the programme was good value for money then? I mean, we talk about over 3,000 operations have been delivered. The cost of this second phase was 18.3 million. Now, obviously, granted, different procedures cost different amounts, but say you just split that evenly over every one of those surgeries, you're looking about nearly 5,800 per surgery or per diagnostic test, you know, whatever it may be. Is, do you think that that was good value for money in terms of being able to reduce these waiting lists? Yes, I think so. So when we originally planned this out, the costings for this were based on on standard kind of tariffs. So when it was planned out, the idea was to make sure we were only spending uh, an acceptable amount of money basically on every surgery or every test. So all that was factored in at the outset. And because Max Care managed to come in on budget with this, it shows that actually, again, that planning was the right thing to do and those tariffs were set at the right level. So in terms of was this efficient and was it an effective use of public money, I think I'd have to say absolutely yes. Laurie Hooper, they're talking about the money that's been spent 
government. Uh, this £18.3 million pumped into Manx Care, and it's funded this uh, synaptic uh, people who apparently are very nice. They're from Scotland, and they've been doing all the orthopaedic, cataracts, and general surgical processes. And uh, I mentioned that everybody knows somebody who's had a new hip or a new, uh, a, a, a new knee, and they've always got a story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> they've always they've always got a story to tell. You can always ask them, did you have a local or did you have a general? And the t- tale goes on from there. Regarding assisted dying, and this is controversial, but I believe that anybody should be able to die if they so choose. They'd always be questioning and counselling for months beforehand, but I believe that having this would actually help re- reduce the number of suicides in the country in a similar way that safe injection rooms help reduce deaths from drug overdoses. But ultimately, if somebody wants to die, they should have the right and be able to do it without suffering, says 653. Um, th- th- thank you, 653. I mean, the only question is, is just what happens if they change their mind? And what happens if, uh, well, there are so many questions to, uh, uh, and, and certainly uh, uh, the question has been asked that the government has uh, a suicide strategy, obviously helping people who are struggling with suicidal thoughts to bring them back from those suicidal thoughts. And at the same time, we have an assisted dying bill coming in. And maybe you remember, is it about a month ago, we were live in Mental Health Awareness Week talking to Juan, a man who confessed, and he was on air perfectly open about it, who has suicidal thoughts every day and battles every day, keeps down a job, keeps down his life, you know, but he has suicidal thoughts every day. These are the burdens that some people actually have to shoulder on a daily basis. And if you don't have to shoulder those burdens, and I don't have to shoulder, shoulder those burdens, it's worth remembering that, you know, some people do. Some people do have those problems. Brenda's on now. Hi, Brenda. Yes, hello. I spoke to you the other day about Isle of Man Bank and oh. not being able to get cash. Oh, yes. Yes, and um, I've just heard about the two Scottish people who were having problems. I also went into the bank, and because I bank with Barclays, um, I was refused cash by the Isle of Man Bank. What did they say? Well, they just said, um, well, it's um, a Barclay card, and um, no, we, you know... We can't do it. So uh, you went to the counter and asked for them to just put your card in and give you some cash? Yes. And did they have any advice of, of what you should do? No. I phoned them up since to see, uh, because I found again yesterday that the machine was still not working. And um, they said they were waiting for parts to come, new parts to come. Well, but this is TT, Brenda. We've got ten, tens of thousands of people, and Port Heron, one of the jewels of the Isle of Man, um, and people can't get ca- short of going to the co-op and getting cash back. They yes. can't get cash. No. So, uh, and did they say? Situation. Did, did they say when they might, you know, possibly get the part for the cash machine? No. I don't think they know. My word. But, uh, yes. But, I mean, mine is a Barclays Isle of Man card. It's not as though it's, um, you know, maybe somebody from Scotland that's got a, a card which is um, on a Scottish bank or yeah. something. Well, that's... Um, so where are you getting your cash from? Uh, well, um, the nearest place is uh, Castletown. Uh, unless, oh, I went, actually, I went to the post office afterwards and bought a stamp and they gave me cash back. Right, OK. But you have to buy something. Oh, my word. All right. Brenda, I appreciate that. Thanks for calling today. You're welcome. Good to hear from you. And here's Victoria now. Hello, Victoria. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, it's just um, a comment that was made. I went to a meeting about the assisted dying bill in Douglas last year. Yeah. And uh, there was a panel of people there, Dr. Allinson was there, who were pro the bill. And uh, there was a, a baroness, I can't remember 
who's Baroness Watts. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, we had her on Man in Line last year as well. Yes, I know the one you're this talking about. one that's pro-assisted dying. She's for it. This is, it's, this, I know you've had somebody else on who is against oh, it. Oh, OK. Well, yes, we had the one that was against it on. Yes. Right. Well, okay. this woman, is she's a Baroness somebody from the House of Lords, and she's pro-assisted okay. dying. And she, these were her words. She said... When Keir Starmer wins the election next year, because, you know, this was last year, she said, and he will win the election, we will get this bill through. And those were her words. And was she, is she a Labour peer? I can't remember what she is. Right. She sort of... Uh, I, I wasn't impressed with her at all because I tried to talk to her afterwards and she was... She was just off it, to be honest. To be honest. She wasn't... Uh, she, she was... I thought she was very disrespectful because we asked her what actually would happen. Yeah. You know, the process, like, we're all trying to find out about. And she just was like, oh, <laughs> I don't know anything about that. And that's really what she was like. And it made me really angry. Where do you stand on this, Victoria? Uh, well, nobody wants someone to suffer. But... I'm worried about the expansion of her bill. You know, and, and a lot of things. When I was younger, I always used to say, oh, why do they let people suffer? And, you know, and then the more you find out, there's, there's quite a lot of elements in it that I don't like. And I think this is, the, this, this is the key, Victoria, that unless you have personal experience of this, unless you know somebody who's been in the situation, we've had many, you know, vivid testimony of people who have been in dreadful pain and dreadful suffering and have had chronic illnesses that cause this. But until this lands on your doorstep, Victoria, I don't think anybody can make a judgment. Well, I'm just... You're just concerned because that that meeting... You know, I have to say, although I disagree with Dr. Allinson, because I don't agree with the bill as it stands, he was probably the most respectful. You know, I don't really know all the ins and outs of the bloke, but there was a doctor over as well who was... Uh, I can't remember the names of these people. It's gone out of my head. I did have the newspaper cutting somewhere. But he was the same when we asked him, well, what actually happens? Because I thought, well, he's a doctor. And it's the same. Oh, I don't know. And, and you know, it, yeah. it wasn't comfortable with it, with the so, attitude. Uh, and again, this is one of the things I brought up in the past, is that we need some detail on this. I mean, it may be a bit morbid, and it, you know, but it, the detail of exactly how yes. it would happen, because this is being done in our name, remember? Yes, we do need the detail. And you know how can we? How can anyone even put a bill through if they don't know all the details of it? Okay. Well, as you said, Dr. Allenson is always respectful. He's always very, very polite about this, mm -hmm. and he's been a GP for years. You know, for decades. So, mm -hmm. as, and GPs see everything from the start of life to the end of life. They've seen blood and guts and everything else. So, I mean, does does that carry carry any weight with you that Dr. Allenson has seen this and this? is his judgment well the problem is he doesn't come out with the details he's a doctor so and that's what we want from him okay all right yep. thanks for calling today victoria it's good to hear well, from you all right thanks a lot from Bye. our castles to our cottages our museums wow. and the great laxey wheel you'll find hidden treasures around every corner when you visit a manx national heritage site Fill your summer making treasured memories with Manx National Heritage. Sites now open every day. By visiting, you help protect our treasured island for generations to come. Plan your visit today at manxnationalheritage.im. They got your whole house in their hands. When you need scaffolding, DPM. On time and on budget, DPM. We'll beat any quote, DPM. We do it all at DPM. DPM promise to beat any like for like scaffolding quote by 10%. So when you need scaffolding, call the friendly, experienced DPM scaffolding team on 61 2000. T's and C's apply. We do it all at DPM. At Thrive Farms, we have a passion for growing and providing fresh local food for the Manx community. As a not-for-profit, community-run business, we need volunteers. There are many opportunities to learn how to grow, harvest and more. Exchange your time for food and community. See Facebook or visit thrivefarmsiom.com for details. Thrive Farms. Our community. Our soil. Our legacy.
This audio has been kindly sponsored by Miller Chaps of Ramsey. Hello, I'd like to rent a car for three days. Just something reasonable. No problem at all. We've just a few rules. You can't go off island, you can't smile in the car, you can't take any friends. Oh, and it's uh, £10,000 a day. Renting a car doesn't need to be difficult or expensive. With prices from just £50 per day, and now collection and drop-off at the airport and Douglas, speak to Rex Rental Company or book online at rexrental.im. Rex Rentals. I'm so glad to hear that. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Nine minutes before one after Man in Line today. It's our midweek 60th anniversary. Kelly's Eye with David Collister, the late David Collister, and Peter Kelly looking at the Strand Shopping Centre on the way. Jewan's with us now. Hi, Jewan. How are you, Andy? Well, very well, too. It's a nice day. Absolutely, absolutely. Just a quick one. I know we haven't got a lot of time, so I'll come back on again maybe tomorrow. I um, haven't been on all week, but I just wanted to mention the um, the concert that was on at the Villa last week, the um, uh, Rumours, the Fleetwood Mac concert, which was put on by the Manning Cancer Group. And um, just got to say what a hard-working team that they are, um, keeping the money on the island and keeping that circulating and everything staying on the island. I think it's absolutely brilliant what them guys do. Uh, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have half the equipment up there and uh, to put them in that new cancer unit. Um, and, and following on from that, circulation of money, um, noticing um, this last couple of weeks we've been out and about, a lot of resurgence of cash, adults spending cash, actual hard physical cash, which is fantastic to see. I think they've caught on to the fact that once cash is gone, we might have a problem with tokenization, And maybe that's a problem with the banks because the banks don't want that to happen. So maybe that's the angle that they're doing in not pushing easier cash machines and not fixing them in time. And well, we've you never would, heard have, of this you would before, have thought, I mean, we? I can't believe that the Isle of Man Bank hasn't got a spare cash machine anywhere on the Isle of Man. Surely they've got all the parts for a cash machine. It, it's it's crazy, isn't it? And you know what? I just say to people, keep spending the cash, make it more awkward for them so they have to go and get these cash machines. Go to the cashiers at Tesco rather than the self-checkout. Keep the people employed because we know where this is heading. And, and you know, that all this year, not having cash machines work, it's all heading in that direction. You can see where they want to push people. So, you know, I encourage people to keep doing that. And, and I've seen that the last couple of weeks, which is fantastic. People with actual physical money in their pocket keep making it go around the island and keep spending it. Um, absolutely brilliant. And um, I agree with some of the um, comments Bonzo made there. I think we have to be very, very mindful of where the elections are going over there and what the effect is on the Isle of Man. Um, looking at the, a huge um, Reform Party rally um, this week and their figures are going up in, in, the, uh, in the rankings over there. Maybe that's why the Conservatives decided to get in early because I think they're going to lose their spot maybe to Reform in six months' time. Oh, right. um, and a huge rally over in London at the, uh, at the weekend, 750,000, I think, live on Twitter watching the um, uh, Get Back Britain um, rally in, in London. So... Um, a lot of things happening, but um, leave it at that. I'm sure at the end of the show, and I'll speak to you in the week, Andy. All right, thanks for that, Ewan. Good to hear from you. These little voices in our heads telling us to drive at 20, turn off your engine, you can't use that road, the camera will get you there, you mustn't stop here, you'll get a fine, you'll get a fine, you'll get a fine. The fine might be £80, you can't afford it this month. The sort of low noise that creates anxiety and despair in some people, especially young and old drivers. Thanks for that. And thanks to Howie on the phones today. W-I-N-T 60 years serving you as the nation station. This is Max Radio. Kenny's Eye, brought to you by Ellis Brown Architects. Peter, with the sound of distant bells, <laughs> what's Kelly's eye looking at today? Yeah, alarm bells. Uh, looking at the ubiquitous atrium. The ubiquitous atrium, that means atriums are everywhere. They are in modern buildings. Oh, yes. Um, it seems to be the thing to have an atrium. Uh, in the olden days, it was a glazed courtyard, but now it's an atrium. And this, I suppose, was probably the first on the island, I think, with modern buildings. Uh, to have an atrium of this magnitude. No. Um, we're standing looking at what appears to be the front entrance to a building, but is really 
the back exit, uh, despite the imposing flights of, of stairs and ramp over on the, on the right-hand side. It's polychrome brickwork, which means more than one colour, and it's two. Uh, no, it's not, it's three. It's three colours. There's the red brick, yes. a dark sort of black brick that's going a bit grey, and then the yellow brick. And then all the other bits, the windows and um, guttering, I think, are all done in blue, a royal blue. And written on either side of the two pillars, it says, The Strand. Yeah, there used to be a song called Let's All Go Down the Strand. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say. <laughs> Have a banana or something. Yeah, um, yeah where at the, what is now the bottom of Weld Road Hill, of course, it wasn't always the bottom of Weld Road Hill. And in fact... Um, and... It is the only one we have here. They may have them in Birmingham, they may have them all over Britain, but it's the only one we've got in Douglas, isn't it? It is. You'll have to excuse me. There's, there's a young lady with a short skirt that keeps blowing up walking past. My attention is attracted elsewhere. <laughs> um, now, what was I saying? Yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. It's, it's, it's the only one we've got of this nature. Although, of course, we've got the Tower House, which again works on this atrium principle. In fact, there's an awful lot of atrium there. I mean, anywhere else they'd have floors and floors going across. But, no, it works. It, it, it perhaps is a pity that on this rear entrance you've got these st steep steps going up, although there is the ramp, which most people don't bother to use. But I suppose the vast majority of people do come in from the Strand Street side as opposed to coming in uh, from this particular side. Many of the most iconic buildings around the island have been designed by Ellis Brown Architects. Keep up with Ellis Brown today on Facebook or via ellisbrown.in. Part of Island Life for 60 years. This is your Manx Radio.